Praise the Lord. I am glad uh, to be in your midst one more time. I trust that uh, God has kept everybody safe, and I praise God for all his goodness. Uh, I'm going to continue in our study of the book of um, Acts. So if you'll turn with me uh, to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. I'm going to read uh, the first verse. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So I'm going to read it again. And certain men came down from Judea, taught the brethren, keyword brethren, and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So um, I'm going to continue. I, there's probably a few more things we could touch on from chapter 14. But um, given what Minu spoke about uh, a couple of three weeks ago, I wanted to continue in that same topic. And um, if God leads us, we, we go back to chapter 14. Otherwise, we'll keep going. But um, if you remember, Minu spoke about um, grace and laws. And he talked about the different types of laws and uh, that... There are 600 plus laws that were given in the Old Testament, right? So, what one thing you'll see um, as the church in the New Testament is progressing, after the church was birthed, and as it was progressing, there also started to enter into the church some false teachings. Okay, so now we're exactly at the midpoint of the book of Acts. There are 28 chapters, and this is the beginning of the 15th chapter. So as the church is now being established amongst growing beyond uh, Jews only, right, and now being established amongst the Gentiles, there are certain, uh, there's some certain pushing and pulling about how now, you know, because it's a new territory, right? They've never had... Gentiles, like if you remember, these Jews are not even supposed to eat with the Gentiles, right? We covered all of this when we talked about Cornelius and all of that. They were not even supposed to eat with them or have any association with them. They considered themselves separated for God. And so when now these Gentiles are now becoming Christians or followers of Christ, there was a tension on how are we going to, um, what are we going to tell them about day-to-day -day living and day-to-day -day Christianity? Okay, you all with me? So, uh, and as you see, this last time, last few times we talked about how everywhere Paul went, uh, the Pharisees or the Jews who did not believe in the gospel, right, they were envious or jealous and they were trying to persecute Paul and Barnabas and prevent them from spreading the gospel. So when the devil saw that tactic did not work, he introduced a different tactic, which was, okay, maybe we just change the teaching a little bit. Maybe we change the gospel a little bit, and that will keep them away from the grace of God. You all with me? So all of these are just tactics that the devil uses to keep us from coming to the fullness of the knowledge of Christ. So as uh, Pastor John Verghese was speaking a couple of weeks ago, he spoke about rat poison. Right? He said what well, rat poison has entered into the church teaching so that 99% of rat poison is actually fit for human consumption. It's just a 1% that's going to kill you. Right? So it's the 1% that's been killing the church. So the same thing in different formats has been entering into the church from the first century until now. It shows up in different ways, but it's the same tactic. The, the, the goal is to keep us away from knowing God 
fully. And his grace, experiencing his grace fully. Okay, so what we're talking about here is that the Jews now from uh, uh, Jerusalem, now they're coming to these places where people are becoming Christians, right? These Gentiles who are becoming Christians, and they're telling them, you have to be circumcised and follow all of Moses' laws, 612 of them, and only then you can be saved. It clearly says that you cannot be saved unless you do these things. So the problem with that is what they are saying that the grace of God or the work of Christ is not sufficient to redeem us from sin, that they had to do these works also. You all with me? So, so anyway, so, but what it also shows is that they did not understand the gospel. They did not understand what the gospel is really teaching. If you're going to teach something like this, that means you never understood the gospel in the first place. Okay, and that's where, and why is it important for us? Like the reason we're studying all of this is not to know uh, the history of this. I mean, that's, uh, that's good to know the history, right? We all know all of these things. Before I said these things, you already probably figured out where I'm going to go with this, right? You know all these things. But what does this mean for my Christian life today is what we have to understand. So what does this mean? So if you'll flip to the next uh, slide, I'm going to uh, kind of explain this step by step. Okay, so I've shown this picture before, and um, so pardon me if this is a little bit like a Bible study, but this is so important that we need to understand this. And this is... So important, I'll touch on this later, that Paul wrote books about speaking this false teaching in the church, okay? So now every person, we are like this iceberg, okay? So have you ever heard of an iceberg, kids, right? So an iceberg are these huge mountains of ice in the middle of the ocean, okay? So the th interesting thing about the iceberg is only thing you can see above the water and it still looks like a huge mountain, right? The iceberg looks like huge mountains, but you only can see a small part of the iceberg, even though it looks big above, above the water, you can only see a small part to the visible eye. But underneath the water, there's this huge mass below the water, okay? So that's the iceberg. So we are all like this. So if you click the next slide, you can see this part above the water represents our words and our actions. So everything that we know about each other is represented by what? The things we say or the things we do, right? So we decide somebody is good or bad or that we are good or bad based on what we do or what we say, right? And because of those things, we either decide somebody is good or bad or that we are good or bad. So we don't say certain things, so we immediately think we're a good person. We don't do certain things, so we immediately think we are a good person. You all with me? Yes? Okay, so at least I know I can't hear you, but maybe you can nod your head. So, <laughs> so anyway, so, so this is, and I, we are like this iceberg, right? But we know... And God knows there is so much more to us that nobody else can see. And many times, we ourselves cannot see the part below the water. Okay? And go to the next slide. So I'm going to explain this step by step. So these, because we don't understand what the law means and how, what it means in connection with the gospel sometimes. And we're confused. Like, should I be following the law or... What is going on? Did God say those are not important? No. See, God gave before Christ comes came, there was no solution for the part below the water. Okay? There was no way to fix our heart before Christ came. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But until then, 
he introduced the laws to show Israel as a separate people for himself. And he gave these laws and said, follow these rules so that you can be righteous in your words and actions. Okay? You all with me? So he gave these laws and said, follow them and you'll be righteous. But what happened is, go to the next slide please is that when God saw their thoughts and their imaginations and their intentions and their desires and their beliefs, and he saw that they were just merely hypocrites, just like the Pharisees. They could not follow the law in the way that God wanted them to. And... That is our sin nature. We cannot follow God's laws by just merely doing actions. You all with me? So what does this mean? What am I talking about? Because when it says Christ came to fulfill the law, what does that mean? It, what it did was showed us what God's laws really were. It's not that these Levitical laws were now all of a sudden irrelevant, but he showed the part underneath the water. Okay, so if you go to the next slide, that is the fullness of God's law. So that means when God said, do not commit adultery, he's saying, don't just not do it physically, but also in my view, if you look at a woman and commit adultery in your heart, you've already committed adultery with, in my eyes. So he just showed us the whole thing when Christ came. You all with me? And this is what, so love your enemy, right? It's a, the Old Testament law is what? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? Get revenge for what somebody did to you. But in the New Testament, it's, Love your enemy as yourself. Don't hate your brother. Don't call him a fool. All these things we covered when we covered the Sermon on the Mount. Right? So this trips us up. So what happened is this rat poison of legalism has entered our churches from generation to generation. So what happened was that now instead of seeking to fulfill God's laws, that means seeking to be like Christ, our, that our thoughts and imagination intentions being sanctified and being transformed, we've gone back to legalism saying, we just had to do certain things. And then we're holy and righteous. That's the rat poison that's entered our church. So all these things we've been talking about, right? Justin spoke about you know, the characteristics of an uh, ideal church. Why do we not desire those things? It's because we think we're righteous and we only look at the part above the water. You all with me? We spoke about all this thing, giving, tithing. We only care about giving 10% barely because we think those things part above the water is enough to be righteous. But God is seeing when you give the 10%, he's looking at your thought and intention behind it and he's saying... It's almost as if you didn't even give because you gave it begrudgingly. I don't want your money. He's, God is saying, is not the cattle on a thousand hills mine. I don't need your sacrifices. You know, we all desired over the uh, uh, lockdown period to come and worship together. But if you are coming here because you can feel righteous about coming to church and God is seeing the part below the water and saying, I'd rather you just stay at home. You know what I'm saying? This is what, how we have to look at it. So because of this, Paul is seeing this false teaching entered into the church. So he wrote to the Romans. If you read Romans, uh, I mean all of it, but 6, 7, 8, do you understand what he's saying about this? Or he wrote uh, Galatians and, and, and parts in Ephesians and Colossians. If you, when you read and study those things, you understand that we have gone back to legalism. 
we made all these rules and we have made 613 uh, Malayali Pentecostal laws instead of the Levitical laws. And as long as somebody fits that box, they're holy and righteous. Unless, as long as we fit this box, we think we're righteous. But God is looking under the water and he's saying, you're lacking. The Christ nature has not been produced in you. And he's saying, I want you to meet the standard of the Sermon on the Mount. Then who can be holy? Who can be righteous? If we measure against the Sermon on the Mount, we're all lacking. We're all short of the glory of God. We're all short. Our righteousness is filthy because nobody can meet the standard. You all with me? That's why Paul is saying, so does that mean we should keep sinning because there's no point? Is that the point? Is that, okay, so, I mean, you're a, I hear this all the time, right? You're a sinner, I'm a sinner, what's the point? Let's just keep doing it because nobody can meet the standard. But if we think that way, we have failed to understand the gospel. We have failed to understand why Christ died for us. Okay, so now, and I'll come back to that, but if you go to the next slide, I wanted to make a couple more points just to illustrate this. So just an example of these things, that we, the way we think about it, right? We do all these works. We come to church. We speak from the pulpit like I am. Uh, and or lead worship, we do work tirelessly for the church. We, uh, you know, attend meetings all week long, speak in tongues, we pray, do all these things. All these works, we pile up and pile up and pile up and we think we're holy. And we think we're righteous. And God is putting on his weighing scale. And he said, can you hit the next slide? And he said, when I measure it. I don't see the love or the joy or the peace or the long suffering. Look at all the word things we pray for. Look at all the things we desire. God, deliver me from this and that. God, give me these things. And God desires to give me those things. But maybe he's waiting for the fruit to be produced. Maybe that's why he hasn't answered our prayer. Because it is more important to him that his fruit be produced in us, then he deliver us from whatever it is. You all with me? We changed the gospel and said, we have to go to God. God can answer all our prayers, but we fail to say this side of the gospel. Because we, we teach our children that they can get saved when they're teenagers, and then you're all set for life. Or that if you just, Sing, join the worship team, you know, that to me, that looks like you're doing good um, in life. If you join, you know, whatever, go do some ministry, uh, we fool ourselves to say, that's enough. That means that you're doing good. But God is looking below the water and saying, we are lacking, right? Who, but who can be righteous? That's why Paul at the end of Romans chapter 17 said, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin? Who will deliver me from this body of sin? What does it say uh, in Malayalam? Yo, Arishta Manishan. He's realizing that he cannot meet the standard. He can't meet the standard of the Sermon on the Mount. I can't love my enemies as myself. I can't stop the temptation from coming into my mind. I can't stop doing all these things that I'm not supposed to do. Who will save me from this wretched man that I am? But this is the point of the gospel. This is why God saved us. So he can transform us to obey God's laws. Okay, so, and for that, and the key is, in Romans chapter 6, 16. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, 
whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So who we yield to, go to the last slide, um, who we yield to, okay? That means it's like when you come to a traffic sign, yield, what does that mean? Let the other person go first, right? So when we yield to the Spirit, see, the other thing we've been also been talking about, and the worship team, please come forward, uh, is also about Saul and David. I spoke about that a few weeks ago, about the flesh and the spirit, right? All of these things tie together because if we don't allow the spirit of God to work in us, as Reuben was speaking a few weeks ago in the youth group, he said, guard your heart. Guard your heart. That means it's a daily process. We have to live out the gospel on a daily basis. We have to protect ourselves from this rat poison. We have to protect ourselves from believing that we are righteous and holy and better than other people. We have to allow the Spirit of God to soften our hearts, to see Him for who He is, and allow Him to change us and, and transform us. And so that the part below the water is also changed into the image of Christ. You all with me? It's like Isaac. When he, he yielded to his father, he said, well, I, I mean, I have, we have the, the elements of worship. We have everything we need. But where is the sacrifice? See, if we meet God's standard, we are like Isaac. We were, should have died under the knife, right? We should have died. But it's not a one-time thing. The things we do daily were worthy of death. But every day, God has made, prepared us a ram, a lamb for us who's taken our sins. Every day, God has prepared. If you're struggling with sexual sins in your mind, God has prepared a ram that can cleanse you of that sin. But if we think you're righteous and holy and continue to do struggle with those things and not allow the Spirit to transform us, we're going to remain in our sin. We'd say that I don't love my brothers like I should and we think we're righteous and better than somebody else. Then we're still in our sin. But God has prepared a lamb, a ram in the thicket to transform us and that the part below the water is also changed. So let this rat poison not poison us. Let us come back to the true gospel. May his name be glorified.